veiling and unveiling embody cultural traditions, faith, lifestyles, opinions, perceptions, politics, and sexuality. Both visible and invisible, these two verbs, actions, invite discussion and controversy of challenging nature. While not physically revealing, the veil remains provocative in its concealment. The subject retains powerful symbolism outside the Muslim world, addressing or connoting subjects such as domestic life, oppression, women's rights, the gays, and the other. There is a complex relationship of the veil with contemporary society, and it is fitting to look at examples that present a transcultural questioning and exploration of various approaches to the literal and, moreover, metaphorical meanings of the controversial topic of unveiling. Through the work of three radically different individuals, Hussein Chalayan, Kutlu Ataman, and Nilbar Güreş, this paper will query the diverse positions that unveiling and covering hold in the fashion as well as the contemporary art world, demonstrating that veil is subjective with different meanings in different contexts, exactly as was previously discussed. This presentation will also address the challenges of existing between cultures, producing tension and the role that unveiling plays. These three snapshots will take veiling as the common thread, one that interweaves art, design, and fashion with veiling. Hussein Chalayan, who is uh, based in London, is a Turkish Cypriot born in Nicosia in 1970, and throughout, it, throughout his childhood moved between Cyprus and England. Renowned for his mastery of catwalk drama since student days at the Central St. Martins, the designer is able to generate a hum of anticipation, even from the most jaded of fashion audiences. Lauded as one of the most cerebral designers of his era, Hussein Chalian's innovative mix of design, science, and art has won him significant acclaim and exhibitions in the leading art and design museums around the world. Listed as one of the 25 most powerful figures in the industry by the British Fa uh, Fashion Council. He was also awarded British Designer of the Year consecutively in 1999 and 2000, and also credited by Time magazine as one of its 10, uh, sorry, 100 most influential innovators of the 21st century. Chalian addresses issues of displacement nomadism and identity in his work. He has reinvented the notion of transforming the garment into a sculptural, performative object. My focus will be on his groundbreaking spring-summer collection of 1998, poignantly titled Between. This unorthodox collection debuted during the 1997 fashion season and embodied a provocative exploration. Creating one of the most searing fashion images of the decade, this show presented the viewers how something as simple as a hemline could con connote so much meaning. Chalian used the chador as the fulcrum of his fashion show's grand finale. The first model emerged completely naked, except for the mask often, uh, often worn with the black body covering a baya or a cloak. The next model wore a niqab, along with an abaya cut off just above the waist, exposing the model's sex. Then another model appeared with the abaya cut off just below the waist. The procession continued with the models increasingly covered until they were completely hidden beneath the garment. The show ended with six models dressed in black chadors of varying lengths. Chalian says, Quote, why did I do it? It was about how we define territory culturally, in terms of how we dress. I was really interested in the idea of multiples. If I saw five other people wearing the same thing, how that becomes monumental in a way. How that forms a territory around you. That's how it started. To redefine the cultural codes, I looked at South American religious attire and made these square head dresses, which framed faces. And finally, I wanted to look at the chador and thought, well, 
We're trying to be anonymous, but actually it has the reverse effect. It was imbued with so many ideas, such as nurture and nature. You're born nude, through this cultural conditioning, you become like a mummy, in a sense. And then, of course, it was controversial, because it's a chador. When I see a covered woman, I think it's like a floating body, where identity is suspended. Controversial, but not confrontational, Chalian made a statement about nature, symbolized by the nudity, and nurture, symbolized by the chador. The probing political and cultural references are the fertilizer for his creativity. His unique position in art and design propagates the fabric of ideas that underpin his work. Chalian's observation of the body language an investigation of the cultural space has led to the collection, which, according to him, is supposed to illustrate a particular kind of position. This was about the cultural loss of self. To move on to my second uh, example, Kutlu Ataman, who is from Istanbul and he was born in 1961. Uh, he has pursued a career both as a filmmaker and as an artist, and his work documents the lives of marginalized individuals, examining the ways in which people create and rewrite their identities through self-expression, frequently blurring the line between reality and fiction. Women Who Wear Wigs is a video installation operating at the limits of documentary, fiction, and contemporary art, featuring four women from Turkey talking about their wigs and the reasons for wearing them. The video lasts nearly 60 minutes and is shown in a continuous loop. And here, obviously, you're seeing an installation shot. The stories of the four women run simultaneously, creating a cacophony of sounds and images that, at times, makes it difficult to follow each woman's individual testimony. Commissioned by the 48 Venice Biennale in 1999, women who wear wigs, despite being presented as a multi-screen installation, is deliberately modest in technique, retaining the immediacy that characterizes home movies. The first video features the writer Melek Ulagay, who presented who protested the military dict dictatorship in Turkey and was obliged to wear a wig to avoid arrest and possible murder. As an artificial blonde in a country that is mainly dominated by brunettes, she disguised herself as Leila the stewardess, taking on a mythic name within the activist resistance movement. In the video, she is first shown in a wig store, as you're seeing here, and later in front of a mirror in her bedroom, recalling the events of her youth, while she puts on and styles the wig. Sorry. Her face is always disguised, usually cut by the frame. The second heroine, journalist and TV presenter Neval Sevinde, began to wear a wig after she was diagnosed with breast cancer, and the side effects of chemotherapy left her with no hair. In the video, Ataman accompanies her to a chemotherapy session, where she's portrayed confidently facing up to cancer, while she explains how she was diagnosed, her reaction, and how she never lost her sense of humor. Later, she appears at a hairdresser, reflecting on womanhood, intimacy, and boldness. The video of the third protagonist operates in stark contrast to the others, in that the subject remains invisible and unnamed, as you're seeing here in the, actually the third, um, the third screen. In this video, the screen is black, and only her words are projected in white subtitles on the black screen. A devoted Muslim, she's a student from Istanbul who has decided to wear a wig to attend university, where headscarves, as well as other religious symbols, were forbidden at that time. The wig allowed her to reach a compromise with the conflicting requirements of her university and her religion. This way, she looked secular enough to the authorities at the university, while her head was covered, as her faith requires, according to her. 
Demek Demir is a transsexual who wore a wig to pass as a female uh, when she worked as a transsexual prostitute. Recorded in her apartment, Demir talks to the camera about the symbolic, performative, and transforming significance of the wig she wore after the police had violently cut off her natural hair or when her hair was thinning from the stress of repeated police brutality and social harassment. Quote, Ataman examines historiography as the history of his witnesses. In his art, the individual crafts history. Through the prism of the wig, Ataman, in the words of Nilüfer Göle, uh, as, the, as Nilüfer Göle notes, the transformative impact of modernization on the private and public spheres, on the relations between men and women, and on the self-definition of Turks. As he combines biography with history, and in a manner unveils the ideological wig. Through their statements, these women explain how they have constructed their identities at different times through wigs. It becomes evident that while each woman has a different and compelling personal situation, their experiences are connected by broader issues involving gender, identity, and oppression. By juxtaposing these four testimonies, Ataman examines the many different factors, whether conditioned by society or by individual actions and beliefs, or due to illness, that are involved in the creation of personal identity. The comparative aesthetics in women who wear wigs, for instance, enacts a self-scaling. It explores the con uh, conventional scalar units, such as the bodily, the national, the global, but cannot be reduced to them. Wig as concept abstracts these scales and operates as the artwork's own scalar unit. The different necessities of wearing wig as a disguise, as a vain compensation, as a substitute veil, as a device for appearing more desirable, more beautiful, are all presented. As Ataman has said, identity is not something that you possess, but something that you wear. Nilbar Güreş. Through the last example of Nilbar Güreş, we see how the Turkish artists work with their own image and their perceived image, a meta-image. Güreş, who was born in Istanbul in 1977, lives in both Vienna and Istanbul. After receiving her BA from uh, the Faculty of Fine Arts in Marmara University, she moved to Vienna in 2000 when she was 23 years old where she completed her MA in painting and graphics at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. As an artist who got her preliminary artistic framework and education in Istanbul, and later in Vienna, her work is inspired by her daily experiences and observations. One of her first video works, Yabancı, Stranger from 2006, deal with women, identity, and dress codes as they relate to issues such as nationality, ethnicity, and class. Stranger is composed of four videos, and the focus will be on the first video, Person of Cloth, which depicts a woman on the Vienna subway wearing a blue and red floral print that totally covers her face and body, topped by a black hat scarf with embroideries on its edges worn in the style of villagers in Turkey. As the camera shows both the protagonist and the wagon that she sits in, we see that she's sitting with her legs crossed in the subway, and the only one who pays attention to her, as you can see on the left side of the image, is the boy, who cannot stop actually watching her. Some stare, but most ignore her, and as the announcement for the next stop is done in German, she remains put only sometimes shifting and looking around. In another instance, she is literally perched on the seat next to a man. She looks around her and the camera zooms on her face and the video ends with her facial close up. She visually creates a foreigner, an isolated migrant using textile, a female, pres a female prescribed medium in an environment that only seems to represent ignorance and invisibility. The fabric has a two-sided mission, both of veiling 
and revelation. The textile that covers her in the video also makes us wonder how claustrophobic and breathless she must be underneath it. With no open hole in the textile, the artist is completely wrapped in it. As Guresh covers herself, she uncovers a silent prejudice. It is not only the fabric that covers her body, but also a social fabric, as dressing and undressing are fundamentally codes. May not, maybe not only undressing herself, but most importantly, to des the desire to undress the male hegemonic system in Turkey, and at the same time undressing and unpeeling the, the Turkish image in Europe. Turkey's patriarchal rigidity seems to be covered in the soft textile. The softness of the textile becomes a buffer zone of flowery textile against the patches of incomprehension. Can art express the residue of various influences on the maker, including displacement or mobility? Autobiographical account is often part of the artwork, and the border between the artwork and the artist's biography becomes fluid. Hence, we might speak of a new kind of authorship, intimately related to the artist as an individual, but also mediating between home and abroad, and thus fundamental in the reshaping of identities. The anthropologist Johannes Fabian argues that culture is not a situation, space, or state, but a process of confrontation. By calling the work person of cloth, Nilbar Guresh poignantly points out how the others, in this case the Austrians, view the Turks. Needless to say, within the European context, the veil signifies the other and is a source of political dispute. However, Guresh takes up the veil not as a religious or national symbol, but one that belongs and is assigned to women. Having never worn a veil in her life, the artist says, in my work, the veil also comes into the picture, but in different contexts and forms, as an everyday personal object that belongs to women, not necessarily as an object of discrimination or religious symbol. Other than that, the veil is not a big issue for me. Womanhood, femininity, space, and norm are constantly interrogated through her work. It is also noteworthy to, to point out that Grish is more interested in how the works will be read by women. <coughs> the veil might be understood as a tangible correspondent of another unseen, of an accumulation of stereotypes and cemented notion about Turkish women. In conclusion, these three snapshots of the complex cultural phenomenon of different forms of veiling present us the profoundly politicized nature at the intersection of dress, body, and culture. The current global debate that is likely to extend well into the future will continue to shape artistic practice. However ambiguous, empowering, or reactionary these artistic positions may be, their examination and presentation is a significant and necessary contribution to an evolving discussion that seeks to redefine failing. Thank you.